three, and we're recording. Welcome back to another epidose of uh, the usual suspects talking about eating meat and other uh, related subjects. And today, we're going to have Raymond do a little presentation for us. He put this presentation uh, together um, to share with his local chapter of the um, Vincent Price uh, Horror Film Association. Nah, just kidding. It was... <laughs> It was the, uh, no, I can't remember. Uh, oh, crap. What's the name Western of it? Western A. Price? Western A. Price. Price. Yeah. <laughs> My joke killed me. I just stepped on myself pretty bad. Uh, the Western A. Price uh, uh, Association. So, anyways, uh, we thought it'd be great to have Ray come on, bring a slideshow, uh, tell us all about it, and maybe field a few questions. So, here we are. Uh, Ray, why don't you... Uh, set this up and start sharing all right i'll go ahead and share my screen so uh i understand all you carnivores probably get this but uh i wanted to let other people who are not carnivores why uh, red meat why would you want to add red meat to your diet so i think that's an important thing but first let's decide what is red meat red meat is reddish in color due to the high amounts of myoglobin a protein in meat that holds oxygen in the muscle. So not all red meat can be identified solely by its color. Pork, for example, is typically considered red meat, even though it is light in color. So some examples are beef, pork, lamb, veal, goat, non-bird game like venison, bison, and elk. Now, how would you guys describe red meat? For me, pork should not even be on there, personally. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I don't see pork as red meat. I mean, you know, to me, red meat is more like beef, the lamb. I like guess the ruminant, goat. right? Yeah, the ruminants. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the way I feel. So I don't think pork should even be on there. But that's that's according to, the, you know, Google. So I, I believe it's really ruminant. And the other thing is, here's what's interesting. So the red part, the myoglobin, is the the oxygen that holds in the muscle so we're talking about to me that's a very important factor alone why you want to eat red meat you get more oxygen there you go well that might have scientific so help us out you know my my take on this is the whole language of meat is so distorted and it doesn't mean the same thing to to people everywhere because you know sometimes you say meat and people think you're only talking about beef and I'm like, what are you talking about? Meat is just a flesh of animals. It doesn't matter if it's a cow, a pig, a chicken, a fish, a, a stork, a, yeah, yeah, next yeah. door neighbor, whatever. Yeah. It's all it's all meat, you know. And then red meat. Okay, I could get it. You know, sometimes you look at pork and it's a pale color. Yeah. But uh, traditionally, I think it is considered a, a red meat. You know, I mean. Well, I mean they bleed, really, right? You cut a pork. I mean they do bleed red. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, another yeah. little interesting thing is because of the Angela Statin protocol, I had to track potassium for a long time. And uh, like an ounce or like, you know, eight ounces of pork had roughly the same amount of potassium as eight ounces of beef, which is also kind of interesting. So like they might have similar nutrient density as well. Interesting. Yeah, it's good yeah we, we might surmise that the real connection here should be if it's a ruminant because ruminant meat like uh, cows and goats and sheep and you know stuff like that bison elephant stuff like that they uh, um, they seem to be what we evolved to eat right so that might be the significant factor but I think that's a long ways from the language that people typically use you know and that's yeah. that's what gets me I, I think people need to be specific, you know. And most think, importantly, the Beyond Meat Burger is not meat. That's right. Most important. So I'm glad you uh, segue into that. Can you guys see the common myth for red meat? So we're yes. going to go into the myth part. So how did they get all that kind of wrong? So we're going to start off with meat causes cancer. Uh, Dr. E, Dr. Georgia Eads, she's got a great website that destroys the World Health Organization on there. You know, who thinks that, uh, uh, I believe they say, uh, processed meat causes can colon cancer. Isn't that right? Isn't that how it's worded? 
So yeah. here's what's interesting. The bullet point here, World Health Organization does, does not disclose their financial ties. So for all we know, they're tied into the Seventh Day of Venice some way, somehow. You know, they have, uh, I, I do believe they have uh, some vegetarian uh, uh, <laughs> vegans on their board. World Health Organization document is a political document, not scientific. So it's not there to show you the data. It's there to tell you what to think. So I thought that was very interesting. The World Health Organization, a mere, uh, what they used, uh, for example, is uh, six experimental studies suggesting a possible link between meat and collateral cancer, four of which were conducted by the same research group. Three of the six experimental studies were concluded solely on rats. Rats are not humans and may be physiologically adapted to uh, high meat diets. All rats were injected with powerful carcinogenic chemicals prior to being fed meat. Now, this is very interesting because uh, we, we, we have two issues. First of all, rats and humans are very different on how we handle high meats. Not only that, high fatty meats. So humans can handle great high fat meats, but we're not sure about the rodents. That's not their natural diet. That's correct. And this is like one of the bones of contention I have with that book, The China Study. You know, when I started reading all these books on nutrition and fitness, everybody's like, oh, you got to read The China Study. And you read it, and this is exactly what, what the, it's like. They have rats that, one, are bred to get cancer. Yep. They're given drugs to give them, more likely to give them cancer. And then they load them up with, you know, toxins that are carcinogenic. And then they put them on a, at a diet that encourages the growth of cancer and a diet that uh, a rodent wouldn't self-select given the options, right? Yeah. And it's true. Human beings could clearly live on nothing but meat and rodents can't. That's right. They cannot. Now, here's what else is interesting, like uh, Tom said. So they, they, they're bred to be carcinogenic. So obviously you don't want to get cancer just by breathing. <laughs> okay. Yep. So now, now what's interesting where it says that all rats were injected with powerful carcinogenic. Now, not only that, they're also fed, for example, like, uh, and that's, how, that's why they say processed meat could be the issue. They're fed a bunch of nitrate and nitrites in a, in a much bigger amount than we ever get in our lifetimes. You know, and then they show signs of cancer. So in a way, yes, processed meat in a very exaggerated form of that nitrate nitrite could cause cancer maybe in humans, but I don't even think that. That's the worst part. So anyways, um, that's one problematic thing on, on that. So, so, sorry, Raymond, can I just throw something in? From memory, with that study, I think that they, they had 42 rats and out of the 42, only three of them got sick, got cancer. It was, it was like some ridiculously low, low amount of, you know. It was a low amount at that. Yes. Point. I don't remember what the amount is exactly. Yeah, I think it was 40, 42 and I think it was only three of them got sick. Yeah, that's why they had to use the word possibly because yeah. there was some that did. So they're not saying that it will cause cancer. It will possibly. So if you see the wording, the wording is actually very politically correct, if you know what I mean. So... Yeah. Justin, what? Justin, didn't you have some insight on, into uh, this whole rodent thing too that you were telling me about the other day? Yeah, so to take this whole rat issue even further, um, so I listened to a podcast called The Portal with uh, Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein. Well, Brett, Eric Weinstein are brothers. It's Eric Weinstein's podcast, but Brett Weinstein was a guest on it. Um, this is also talked about on the Joe Rogan podcast recently with Eric Weinstein. Basically, Brett Weinstein is an evolutionary biologist. When he was getting his uh, doctorate and his postgrad, um, he uh, actually discovered that the rats that are used for experimentation, laboratory rats versus wild rats, um, don't have the same telomere length. Mm. Now, what that means, at least from my understanding, is that um, it makes their life stand completely different in the way they respond to toxins because the laboratory mice um, have longer telomeres versus wild field mice. 
And so that's possibly why a lot of drugs after they're released, you know, they're tested on rats. Um, and then it come, turns out that there's problems in humans later because they don't account for the longer telomeres in the rats that are in laboratories. And these are the same rats come from the same breeding facility uh, that are shown for all experimentation across the world. Yes, that is a amazing co-founder there. So yeah, so you have this single point of failure. So that's just another thing of when you're looking at rat studies to keep in mind. But yeah, for more on that, check out The Portal by Eric Weinstein. Highly recommend it, great show. Great, great, thank you. So, uh, but as you can tell, there's a lot of flaws. Uh, only three of the uh, six experimental studies were human studies. So even on the human studies was an issue. All were conducted with a very small number of subjects and were seriously flawed in more than one way. Examples of flaws includes un using unreliable outdated biomarker and or failing to include proper controls. Not only that, a lot of these human trials like to use, what's that word where you just journal what you eat uh, and you recall what you, what you eat kind of thing? Or they hand out questionnaires. Yeah. They it. say, yeah, as an epidemiology where they, yeah. so they hand out questionnaires and ask you what you ate for the last five years and they yeah. call that science. Yeah. Yeah. And they're or great. Self-report study. Self-report. That's right. So, yeah. So we, we, you can see as, I mean, especially anybody eating a sod diet. I mean, God, uh, back then I could not recall what I ate yesterday morning. I mean, that's how bad it was because it was always different. Nowadays, yeah, that's a little easier because all I eat. You mean you didn't have the same meal every day, Raymond? <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and I think that's probably the same way for everybody else. You know, it's not like we're dogs and we eat the same damn thing every single day. Well, I am now, I guess, but, you know, back then, <laughs> that's not the case. But uh, so, but it, epidemiology uh, studies shows correlation, not causation. So, obviously, it, it's enough to maybe point that there may be a problem, but not to say, hey, this is it. Now, I'd like to show this uh, for carbohydrate. This is another issue when you mix fats and carbohydrates. So I'm going to play a little video about that. And uh, that could cause mm -hmm. issues. But when they this is a uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Benjamin Bickman. He talks about insulin versus uh, glucocon ratio. And he talks about the difference on a sad diet versus, versus a... Uh, a more heavily protein or low low carb diet, and uh, it's very interesting what he points out as far as the insulin and glucagon about the insulinogenic effect of the amino acids as a part of the proteins that we ingest. Well, let's look in the fasted state. If someone is doing this long term ish fast, hopefully they're being smart about it. Hopefully they're avoiding refeeding syndrome. When they eat protein, we see a change in the insulin to glucagon ratio going from 0.8 down to 0.5. And so we see this relative increase in glucagon over whatever relative change is happening with insulin. That's not surprising. That's exactly what we saw with the dogs. Do you remember how the insulin didn't change and yet the glucagon changed substantially? It lowered the insulin to glucagon ratio. So putting this person, at least maintaining them in this very catabolic state. Now with the standard American diet, are you ready? When this person needs protein, we see that their ratio goes up to 70. So about a 20 time increase. And so this kind of gets to the heart. Uh, uh, this gets to the heart of our collective appreciation of the insulinogenic effects of the proteins we eat because it's justified, but we have to put it in the right context. For those of us who are controlling carbohydrates and have a healthy respect for insulin, this, this is us here. Now, what do you think is gonna happen? You ready? When a person eats protein on a low carb diet, it changes from this relatively low level and goes up to <laughs> There is in fact no change. And technically speaking, there's a 6% change, which means that it stays at 1.3. There's a 6% change as opposed to this 20 times change that we saw in the standard American diet. So if we put these two. So we kind of get an idea 
you're welcome to watch it just to uh, Dr. Benjamin Dickman, Insulin versus Glucagon. Kind of says the mixture between uh, fat, fats and carbohydrates has our SAD diet has a very um, negative effect on the body. We're talking about two energy sources. Now, I would like to go on uh, Ted, Dr. Ted Naiman. So, you know, there, there is actually science on how to make rats fat. And this is actually very interesting. You notice where it says 45% fat, 45% carbs, and 10% protein? This is actually the ratio they use to make fat mice. And what's interesting, if you look at most of our diet, that's pretty much what it pertains pretty to. Pretty much all humans will report that the foods they're most addictive to or that are most problematic or that they're going to overeat the most are a combination of carbs and fats. The same thing is true in animals as well. So we have all these, what we call cafeteria diet studies where you take rats and mice and you try to get them as fat as possible, as rapidly as possible. And they have all these complicated obesogenic rat child formulas where you want the carbs and the fats both pretty high, you know, 45% carb, 45% fat, 10% protein. You keep the protein low so the animal has to overeat carbs and fats to get really fat. And uh, we've created obesogenic rat child that's the most fattening thing to animals. And it's this equal mixture of high carb and high fat together. But we've also done these cafeteria diet studies where they basically just feed junk food to rats and mice. And if you give rats and mice unlimited quantities of, you know, they usually just give them pizza and little Debbie's and all this crap that's carbon fats together. And you can basically make these lab animals as fat as you want. It seems that pretty much any omnivore mammal is going to radically overeat food that's high energy density carb and fat together. It doesn't work with just carbs doesn't work with just fat. You give an omnivore mammal a high energy density carbon fat together, it's gonna to automatically eat by 30 or 40 percent of calories. Now that's amazing. So they know what can make fat rats. So what is the name of the cycle when you combine the carbs and the fat together? Tom, do you remember or am I misremembering something? I think you're referring to the Randall cycle. Yeah. Yeah, that's the cycle that regulates that. You know, understanding that is kind of key to key to understanding the difference in how we metabolize a combination of fat and protein versus fat and carbohydrate. Yeah. yeah. Of course, Bart K is a great source on that. I think his best video though is behind a Patreon wall. So, so I apologize. This one I should have made a separate slide saying meat. Uh, uh, meat doesn't create obesity, so my fault. Um, you know, uh, the, the mixture between uh, fats and carbs does so. So, yeah, let's just uh, be a little clear because I, I do remember the Randall cycle now. So, you can eat a bunch of just fat and protein and more or less not gain um, weight, um, or you could eat just a bunch of carbs and no fat and also not gain weight. But the problem is that there's no nutrients in the carbs and the plants. And so, yeah, you'll, you'll stay skinny, almost like you're skinny looking vegan, you know, um, but you'll become nutrient deficient. Whereas if you just eat meat and have the fat and the protein and the nutrients, not only will you maintain a stable uh, body weight or even better um, by American standards anyway, um, but you will also be able to be um, full of nutrients and be able to function optimally. Agreed. Any other comments? No, I think Justin nailed it. Yeah, I agree. So there's also a myth out there that meat causes heart disease and raises cholesterol. So how did we get with this mindset? And that's what I want to tackle with uh, these videos. So I don't think this was on purpose. This was manufactured. And if we listen here to the true history of Crisco, it's fascinating if you uh, I'll play this. This is from uh, Dr. Joel Wallach. One of the biggest ones, of course, is cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol was the boogeyman of all time. You know, it, it even superseded evil spirits, okay? 
cholesterol. It was the cause of heart disease. It was the cause of strokes. And it turns out to be absolutely positively not true. It all started back in 1901 when a um, German chemist was um, uh, actually commissioned, I guess would be the word, by the German Navy to come up with a um, lubricant, a synthetic lubricant for diesel engines used in submarines. And he was successful. His name was Wilhelm Norman, 1901. He was successful, but they only had 100 submarines. So it was um, not too exciting as far as a market. And so he sold his patent to a British soap firm. They wanted to use it to make soap. And uh, um, he said, oh, gosh, people are making their own soap. We can't sell it. And so they sold it to Procter & Gamble. They sold the patent to Procter & Gamble. And they said, we can do a better job of selling soap. And they couldn't sell soap. Even when I was a kid, we were making our own soap in the early 40s. We were making our own soap still. And so Procter & Gamble couldn't sell the soap. You say, well, what's the next biggest market? Submarines are too small a market. Um, soap is a big market, but everybody's making their own soap. Huh, let's sell this food. So they began to dis butter and cream and lard as cooking because it's an unhealthy way to cook. It's, it's saturated fats and has cholesterol in it, and it clogs arteries and does all this stuff. And uh, the American Heart Association was commissioned by Procter & Gamble, who owned the... Um, uh, patent for Crisco, uh, which is the name of this lubricant for um, diesel engines for Nazi submarines, Crisco. And they sold it um, as a healthier way to cook than cream, butter, and lard, which people have been using for centuries. Well, following their lead, saying that that's correct, we wound up with Alzheimer's disease, low T, rectal dysfunction, adrenal exhaustion, severe menopausal symptoms, many other problems, all because of lowering cholesterol in our diet, using egg beaters instead of eggs, boneless skin with chicken breast instead of, instead of chicken with skin. And um, the American Heart Association came out, you know, like a bandit, because they got their $1.7 million back in the, I think it was like 1914, about in there, which is a lot of money back then. It's a lot of money, but it was a lot of money back then in exchange for an endorsement that Crisco was a much healthier way to cook your food and eat than using butter and cream and lard. Well, I looked for 35 years to find a pivotal paper which showed that that uh, belief was correct and you can't find it because it didn't exist. It was all an ad campaign to sell Crisco. Okay, it was a two page, two full page story in the Wall Street Journal about uh, eight months ago in June 23rd, 2014. I think it was a, like a, somewhere between an eight and 10 page story and it was all about Ansel Keys, a guy who was on the board of um, Procter & Gamble on the board of the American Heart Association. He brokered the deal for the $1.7 million from Procter & Gamble um, to the American Heart Association to get them to endorse Crisco as a healthier way to cook. Well, they created Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease did not exist in 1944. Um, today it's number four pillar of adults over the age of 65. Low T certainly didn't exist when I was a kid and grandpa didn't have to worry about low T and erectile dysfunction. Menopausal symptoms, grandma used to go through menopause in three seconds in their 70s because they were still cycling and having babies in their 60s. Okay, adrenal exhaustion is very, very common today where before you have to appreciate testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and, and adrenal hormones are all steroid hormones which are 95% by weight cholesterol. So those damn Nazis, of course, always comes course, back to that. Have to link back to the Nazis, right? <laughs> yep. So what's interesting about this is Ansel Keys, his ties directly into, I mean, being the board of uh, Procter & Gamble was huge. So Procter & Gamble created American Heart Association, not for the health and the heart health of Americans, but to sell Crisco. So it was a big ad campaign altogether, which is amazing. So we were tricked and then yet we got stuck with that idea. So next thing is I'm going to talk about Ansel Keys. How did he, you know, himself try to push this and how did he corrupt the science? And this is Ansel Keys. So, yeah, we were pretty much tricked. So, um, 
I'd like to say, so if you guys want to, uh, that was Fathead the movie. Great movie. Definitely uh, worth watching in the entirety of it. Uh, that was just a little clip of it. If you want some good uh, good data about uh, his, uh, the seven country study that uh, Ansel Keys went through, Dennis Minger does a great job of uh, debunking it. Is it just me or is Ray a little quiet? Ray's really quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so you guys adjust something there, buddy. Thank Sorry. Uh, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, but you're not very loud. Yeah. I didn't change anything. Hang on. Let me stop the share real quick and see if we can reshare. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, what a what a bastard, you know? Um, I didn't even know that actually about Ansel Keys and you know, uh, having just a really bad study and just like, you know what? I'm going to do really bad science and just pick the countries that I like pretty much, you know, that's not yeah. science. And I think, uh, we see this very common trend in all the different poor nutrition science, you know, um, which is why a lot of us, some people think, uh, we're just being, um, Fascesis when we're like, there's no nutrition science. Nutrition science doesn't exist um, because it really doesn't. Because you can't call that an experiment. You can't call paying off the American Heart Association to say that Crisco is good or anyone over there to actually do any real experiments as science. None of that is science, you know. I don't think well, so. And the heart attacks were really rare before 1900, and they actually weren't even really common until like 1940s. That's right. There was like that. no it's the same as diabetes. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? You're, You're still, still quiet, buddy. Quiet. Yeah. You might have to log out and come back in. <laughs> that was I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it's all, it's, all, it's all marketing, isn't it? I mean, the American uh, Heart Association, you know, it's just one big marketing machine, isn't it? Well, it's marketing and it's bad science because this whole thing, you know, we, we hear about Ansel Keys just throwing out the data he didn't like and just kind of shouting everybody down. You know, there's competitors like, uh, I think it was John Yudkin kind of was saying, no, I don't think it is saturated fat. You know, this doesn't work. And he basically just, you know, Ansel Keys made more noise, you know, and so there's been people all along who didn't believe that this theory was correct. Mm -hmm. They're, they've been there. They just didn't make as much noise. And then, you know, we, we hear about this whole thing. They talk about Okinawans, you know, they live in, hardly eat any meat. And they're eating sweet potatoes and crap like that. And then, you know, when Ansel Keys is doing a lot of the studies at the end of World War II, the, you know, the Okinawan pig population had been decimated during the war, right? So, of course, when he goes in there to study them and the, they haven't built up their, their farm stock yet, um, they're not eating as much pork as they traditionally did, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that Okinawans and Japanese eat a lot of fatty meat. It's prized. And this is true even in Hong Kong, you know, where the people eat the most meat. They eat a lot of fatty meat. They have the highest IQ and the highest life expectancy. So, you know, what's, you know, everybody's like, oh, you eat red meat, you're going to get colon cancer. Well, as we see, that myth comes from these stupid rat studies. You know, we see stupid rat studies that are poor science. We see epidemiology, which is barely even science. And this is what sways everybody, you know. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's, that's better. Oh, great. Welcome back, Ray. Uh, we missed you. So I wanted to say the first cardiologist on the scene, cardiologists didn't exist, just like Tom said, until the 1940s. And that's actually chillingly scary. Now, uh, I wanted to also note that uh, back then they used to make Crisco out of cottonseed oil. Cottonseed oil, they used to have cottons, you know, because they, they did textile was big back then. It still is today that the cotton seed were used as, they were toxic, they were toxic waste. They used to have to actually pay somebody to get rid of it. Um, and well, instead of doing that, why not make money off of it? So this was a corporation grab. And of course they knew 
if they got the right person, which as you heard, Ansel Keys was on the chair of Procter Camp and Gamble. He's the one that created the American Heart Association. This was an ad campaign and it worked. It was great. It was probably the greatest in history. We are still full today about this. But anyways, let's, uh, let's go on with this uh, presentation. Hopefully, I'm glad, uh, I hope somebody's getting something out of this. Well, cottonseed oil was used to, to oil machinery. Right. Yes, yeah. it, it was. Uh, so, so Crisco changed it to soybean oil a little later on. Mm -hmm. um, they, were, they were able to mark, a uh, they had a problem getting it uh, grass, well, generally yeah. recognized as safe. The, the name Crisco is derived from co uh, crystallized cottonseed oil. Right. And it has been cottonseed oil for a long time, but now they have to take it off the market because it's been, you know, the government's finally said, you know what, this ain't good. You know, people right. shouldn't be eating this. So, and of right. course, unfortunately, yeah, soybean, they shouldn't be eating either. So they, they started making that soybean, but that wasn't any better. And ironically, yeah. the FDA has approved cotton with the, this genetically modified cotton as food in the future. So, right. And it doesn't matter if you have it, if it's organic or not. That's right. Thank you. Oh, is there organic Crisco? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they have organic canola oil and no, all that's that true. stuff, that's true. That's you true. know, yeah. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So uh, I recommend mm -hmm. FATA documentary because I thought that was a really good documentary that goes into uh, a lot of these things, but that's a great documentary and big fat surprise. Definitely worth a read. The Big Fat Surprise, one uh, surprise that I had reading that, it was how we got tricked into the Mediterranean diet. Believe it or not, and so Keys was behind that too, but I'm not gonna spoil that story, read that book, it's worth it. Just to Yeah, The Big Fat book. Surprise by Nina Teicholz is a great book. It is, so, but yeah, that one was a loop for me, because I was like, wow, he's behind the Mediterranean diet too? I was like, for all, all the people watching this, I'm doing my very best to document everything and put it in the show notes, so you can find links to Fathead, Fat the Documentary, Nina Teichel's Big Fat Surprise, um, and all the videos that Ray's been showing samples of. So you don't have to furiously jot down notes. You can just enjoy and relax uh, and enjoy uh, Raymond's presentation here. Thank you. And there's a, a new movie that just came out called Fat Fiction that's on uh, Amazon Prime and I believe Venmo Premium or Venmo. Yeah, I've not watched it yet, so I'm not sure what's on it. Hit me with that title again real quick so I can get it set up. Fat Fiction? Fat Fiction. Yeah. Haven't watched it either. I'm going to watch it tonight, and maybe we'll do next week's video. Tune in. We can do a Why video wait a week? Fiction. Why wait a week? You guys, this COVID, uh, you know, or this uh, quarantine status ain't going to last forever. Fine. Tomorrow <laughs> at 9 a.m. We're going live. <laughs> Going live. 9 a.m. Going yeah, live. Too early for me. Right. To stay up all night, Zumbo. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Come on, you're carnivore. We got yeah, some toothpicks on my eyes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So I want to show Antolski's chart, and this is this is actually his stuff that he's known about. Th these are these are what he was looking at, and you can tell he really edited it you know, and made it his way. Now, this one I don't want to spend too much time on because, you know, uh, we have plenty of data on this. So meat contributes to climate change. Here's what's interesting. Methane in cows, you guys always hear it. Oh man, you know, the, the cow farts is going to kill us all, right? It's going to make us uh, climate change and have hurricanes or whatever because of cow farts. Uh, well, here's the thing. So there was slightly more cows now in the U.S. than bison when the explorers first came. They, the explorers actually described it this way. There was so much bison that when they would, they would see a sea of black when they, the bisons migrated for three days. And they saw nothing but bison just keep on going and going and going. Now, this was not done by accident. The planes were not done by accident. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, historians this point out theory, that. It's a theory, right? Right. That a, th a theory that these herds were essentially cultivated and the planes were essentially prepared to keep the bison going in big herds, right? 
and that makes sense because that was the Native Americans' food. I would have done the same thing. I want my food to be constantly accessible. Not only that, the natives would follow their bison herds in the migratory pattern. So uh, they, they actually made a path for them, if you want to call it that. It just happened to be a huge path. Now, of course, you know, at the time we thought these guys were savages, they were dumb, whatever. Well, now we're starting to look in a different light. Maybe they were and, not so dumb. And, and let's point out, because I think there's a lot of confusion here. Everybody thinks every indigenous people or primitive people are hunter-gatherers that mostly eat plants and vegetables, mm -hmm. and then they eat some meat here and there. But we know for a fact that some of these Plains Indians ate almost exclusively meat and they ate very little plant material, right? And if they did eat plants, it was made, I'm not going to say in a bad way, I hope. Uh, the, the women were the gatherers. So they would eat the plants, but the warrior man would not because they knew that they had to be in their tip top shape. Not that every single Native American tribe is even remotely the same, but. Right, of course. Yeah. Of course. Good, good, good point there. So, but with uh, the methane in cows, I wanted to give an example. So what causes much, much, much more methane than cows? Well, swamps. I mean, swamps are just constant methane dumpers, but you know what? We can't control swamps. Landfill, that's a different story. Our landfill is, I mean, rampant with methane. So we want to do something, hey, let's lower our waste. How about that? You know, fracking and gas leaks. And I will uh, say, you know, that the modern landfills, at least here in California, they, they have systems to recover methane and they have, you know, obviously to collect liquids and stuff like that to keep the runoff out of the, uh, the water table. But oh, you can cool. actually go to one of the local landfills here and there's an actual gas turbine on site that turns the methane um from the garbage into electricity energy so. oh that's mm -hmm. nice i like that uh, i didn't know that that's good to know mm -hmm. uh so i'm glad there is answers to that but either way all of those produce way more methane than uh the farts in the cow and so can i throw something else in there yeah. i know i want to i don't want to step on you too much but uh before before we had all these bison you know hundreds of millions of bison running around uh, we had woolly mammoths and other, uh, uh, what they call megafauna, you know, three-toed sloths and woolly rhinos, the whole nine yards. So we had all these giant herbivores running around the planet before they got wiped out for the most part between 12 and 14,000 years ago, they really descended. So we had all these huge animals that, you know, would in theory produce a lot more methane than the cows and actually we know they did because of both uh, the fossil record the geologic record the ice core samples and so on and so forth so this uh, animal generated methane really doesn't destroy the environment so that's right i mean bottom line it doesn't so and either way it'd be a small amount compared to some of the stuff that we do so now of course you know uh some will make the argument that oh the grain fed cattle is the one that's causing the most methane because you know that, that they're eating something that they're not supposed to and they're eating our food uh you know the vegans will say that you know why don't you feed us that uh, uh well first of all uh grain fed cattle they they eat the stock they don't eat the actual uh grain per se because that actually gets sold so they eat the stock uh that's uh, help me out here, Tom. Um, they don't. Actually, yeah. Yeah. When when they when they say they feed cows corn, they're not just eating corn kernels. They eat right. the cobs. They do eat some kernel, right? Yeah, some kernel. But yeah. uh, they usually eat the substandard kernel, like a, that's not fit to serve the human beings. They eat the leaves. They eat the stalk of the plant and the roots because corn, like a lot of other crops, the row crops, you plant them, you rip them out, you plant them again. And so a lot of that vegetation winds up being cow food. So cows aren't sitting down and nibbling the, the corn kernels off the, off a nice uh, ear of corn and then, and then throwing the cob and the, the ear, the rest of the ear, the leaves and everything away. They're actually eating that because cows primarily eat things like grass. So they're, they primarily eat, you know, grass and alfalfa 
and then the green parts of the plant like the stalk and the leaves and stuff like that. And really and honestly that is what uh, corn is. It is a grass. So you know that is actually part of the natural diet. But even then they only spend four to six months in the feedlot to be fed that. The rest of the time at least in the United States they are fed grass. I mean, you know, uh, unpastured, they're unpastured. So, but why do they do that? Well, it is quicker to fatten cattle with uh, grain making, uh, to make them, uh, to be able to get to market quicker. And that's the only reason. So uh, this is, this is, this is uh, for costs, you know. Um, so the longer they spend on pasture, the more expensive the, the meat will be. So obviously yeah. we're kind of cost conscious here about, about this stuff. And of course so, we, Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. So what you're saying is that they throw or they, they put the, the cattle into feeding lots to fatten them up on grain. Kind essentially, of. Essentially, kind it's, of. Yeah. So, so essentially, if we eat grains, we fatten up as well then. Yes. That's right. There's no question about it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's very well known, particularly you know, in countries like the United States where they study the heck out of it, how to fatten up animals as efficiently as possible. And there's yeah. no surprise, it's the same for human beings. If you eat these same sort of diets, you're going to get fat, you know. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, cows can only eat a limited amount of grain, and, it, and traditionally it's been the fastest way to, uh, to fatten them up. But, uh, you know, we're starting to hear now from the regenerative regenerative agricultural farms that they found ways to put uh, weight on the cows just as fast, but doing it on grass yeah. naturally. And, and, and there's also, there's also a supplementary feed as well where they have, so instead of finishing, finishing the cattle just on grain, they have access to the grain bins, but can also go out and, and uh, feed on, on beautiful uh -huh. green grass. Yes, yes. So there's supplementary feed as well. Right. So um, now let, let's say, let's say, let's say, you know, a vegan says, well, you know, we want to eat the corn and we don't want to eat the cows because they're beautiful creatures and all that, but whatever. Um, I want to say that, that comment, we got to be careful because if those cows, nobody, if those cows don't make money, and nobody buys cow meat anymore, guess what happens to those cows? They're going to the coyotes. They're going to have a brutal life. They're not going to have at least for their first probably year that normally in those, uh, those are very well taken care of uh, creatures until they die. Death is ugly, but you know what? At least their death is sacrificial to us to uh, provide us to live, especially us as carnivores. So now how important are cows? If you guys check out Alan Savory's work, I'm not going to put that up. Um, uh, Tom is going to uh, put uh, that uh, TED talk on the show notes. So you guys definitely should watch it if you don't know about Alan Savory's work. But I'm going to show you what happens. So cows are uh, pack animals. They hang out very tightly together because there's always usually predators on the outside. We're talking about uh, wolves, coyotes, lions, tigers, whatever. So they're used to herding up together. And what happens when they do and they roam, this was, uh, this is an example of Alan Savory's project. This was before, so it was pretty deserted and all that kind of stuff. So the cow would go over there, uh, you know, dump their manure, their, their, they'd, they'd pee everywhere and they'd eat every little thing that they could or disturb the earth. They're kind of a, uh, uh, till it and then afterwards after they leave it just becomes this this i mean flourish and some places actually become almost foresty that's how important these pack animals are uh but it's not good enough just to have them you have to I imitate you have to have the predators also in our case what what alan savory does is he keeps them tight with, uh, you know, shepherds, whatnot, to, to keep them close and, and, and keep them contained. But that's yeah. how that works. I, I, I like to point out that animals belong on the land. That's the natural state of things. 
And like you said, uh, you know, animals that are well maintained by ranchers and stuff like that live a much better life than wild animals. Mm -hmm. And it's probably our best, uh, our best way to regenerate topsoil, which has been destroyed ever since we started planting crops. And it also is the best way to keep land from turning into desert because these animals walk around and move the moisture with them. Their hooves need the earth and allow the moisture to penetrate into the soil. It allows the uh, microorganisms in the soil to thrive. And that's where topsoil comes from, you know? So if you wanna, if you really care about the planet, you want room and it's like cows and goats and sheep and stuff walking around on it and then all the other animals that come with it. Yep, part of that circle of life. And uh, so not only that they can regenerate our land, they can help feed us too. So to me, that's a win-win-win, which is great. So uh, another myth that we hear about is meat sits in the colon and putrefies. So the, the, I have an article here and uh, says, does meat rot in your colon? what does beans grains and vegetables so here's the thing so beans grains and vegetables is what sits in your colon they're known as soluble soluble fiber and insoluble fiber they're two different soluble fiber uh colon bacteria eats the soluble fiber so really you don't digest that Co uh, your bacteria in your gut will will have to be able to digest part of that and insoluble fiber you can't even break that down at all so it just creates big waste coming out of you. Um, the reason that ruminants can handle that is they have many stomachs, but we don't. Now, how did we get here? How did we get convinced that fiber was, was really, you know, our savior? Um, I'd like to show some, some things about it. Uh, obviously, Dr. Burkett, is that his name, Tom? Dr. Burkett? Burk? or something anyways uh yeah, this doctor sure. in africa he uh he theorized by oh, the fiber guy I yeah, forgot his name. yeah i think it was burkett but i'm not really sure burkett, anyways yeah. he theorized he saw two african tribes and he noticed that there was one ha healthy african tribe and one unhealthy one and the difference between the two was one ate more fiber and ever since he ran with that everybody else followed not questioning they're like oh yeah that's it that's it and then that's how that's how it really started but there's a little more to it the seventh day adventist church i think was really the forefront of even that even before that dr burkett or what his name is um let me show you thank you prescribe this is uh linda fetke she talks about uh the the conspiracy of of the church being involved in all this and uh we'll accrediting and which is the starter is very consistent right here term health and well-being she wrote church the sydney adventist hospital and sanitarium health and well-being she wrote that health food business is to supply the people with food which will take the place of flesh meat and also milk and butter the Seventh-day Adventist Church currently owns 20 processed food industries worldwide, producing in excess of 2,400 breakfast cereals, dairy substitutes, cereal coffees, and a wide range of meat alternatives from nuts, cereals, and soy. Life Health Foods, which is an arm of sanitarium, reports here in Australia of reaping the benefits of an increasing number of people choosing a plant-based diet. Their anticipated 25% growth for the next financial year is purely driven by a rise in vegetarianism among millennials looking for world solutions. In 1863, Ellen G. White was told by God that meat was a toxic substance, as bad if not worse than tobacco or alcohol, a substance that defiled the body and stirred baser passions leading men, women, and children to the heinous act of self-vice. So you guys got that? Meat causes people to have sinful thoughts. And that's why meat is bad. It makes you horny. <laughs> yeah, and I... I, I uh, choking the chicken. <laughs> right. I, I like to, um, you know, remind people that this whole thing begins with a girl 
uh, Ellen G. White, who's hit in the face of the rock, goes into a coma for a few days, and wakes a prophet of God and starts saying, we need to eat this Garden of Eden diet, which is a which turns out to be the vegan diet, is what we know the vegan diet is today. So if you really think this is all founded in science and eating plants is some good idea that just sprang forth from science, think again, because this is, this is the origins of it, at least the modern origins of it. Right. And it gets deeper. So John Harvey Kellogg's, the Kellogg's manufacturer, oh, let's hear from that. Kellogg was just 12 years old when he went to work for the first family of the Adventist church. He was given the task of typesetting Ellen G. White's book, an appeal to mothers, which spoke only of the responsibility of mothers deterring their children from masturbation. Such are just as surely self-murderers as though they pointed a pistol to their own breast and destroyed their life instantly, she said. Is it any wonder that when he became a doctor, John Harvey Kellogg tried everything to prevent intemperance and sinful masturbation? He invented bland breakfast cereals, nut and soy meat analogues, and he prescribed vegan diets. Marketed as health food to curb sexual desires. Before I go any further, I would like to say I'm not anti-religion and nor am I anti-vegan. I'm pro-choice, especially when it comes to health. I respect those who choose to be vegetarian or vegan. So... But we don't respect them. Just kidding. <laughs> How dare you? So that's where the vegan diet comes from. And guess what? There is a famous phrase that an actual vegetarian told me. Oh, I eat nothing with, I eat anything without a face. And I'm like, anything without a face? Where did that come from? I'm like, oh, I thought he made it up. And I found out this is from the LNG White Bible. And I'm like, oh my God, everything these vegetarians and vegans, this was all propagandized from the Seventh Day Adventist. Freaking amazing, all purposely done. To do what? Oh, guess what? Ellen G. White was a big eugenics. She was big on calling the population also. That was a big belief back then. These are not uneducated people. These are very intelligent people. They knew what they were doing. This was not by accident. That's what I'm saying. Is this a conspiracy stream round two? Just I'm sorry. I don't mean <laughs> to make it sound like a conspiracy, but you know what? If you've got a and b and we fell for that c well you know whatever you want to call it well i mean you know just because they don't they make all these products and they don't say on the cover hey our religion says you should eat this right is that you know is that even really a conspiracy look you know this is a religious religious backed movement that most of us don't subscribe to and yet they make products they think everybody should eat and they put them on the market and they try and convince people they're healthier. Is that really a, I mean, you want to call it a conspiracy? Call it a conspiracy. Right. It technically is a conspiracy. It is actually. Right? They were trying to trick people into eating stuff that they shouldn't. So if that is the conspiracy, then yes, that, you know, because it was a trickery. I think that would be the word, right? Maybe not. But, all right, so let's look at science. Dr. Paul Mason, I believe, has probably the best uh, fact about fiber. Uh, and it's not, his study. it's not his study, but he, he goes about talking about a study that they did, a randomized controlled trial. This is probably gold standard study of uh, fiber, what happens in the gut. And I'd like you to watch this and see nice. what you think. I, 63 patients could the research at rate and a few other things like that. But when we look at the symptoms of constipation, the research just isn't there. So I'd like to present to you the best trial that I could find. This was a case control study. So in this study, 63 patients who presented with constipation were recruited and high and low fibre diets were compared in these patients. And this also included a zero fibre diet that required the complete cessation of all vegetables, cereals, fruits, wholemeal breads, and rice. So this graph here represents the percentage of study participants before the study 
suffering from each of the symptoms listed on the right side. So you can see, before the study started, all of them had constipation and strain opening their bowels, and a number also experienced bloating, bleeding, and pain. And when the study participants, in the, those who went on a high fibre diet, we can see that the proportion of suffering symptoms actually increased, especially bloating. So then there was a reduced fibre arm. And what you can see here is that those on the reduced fibre diet actually demonstrated a modest reduction in symptoms. So the question is, what happened to those, the majority of those in the study, who had zero fibre in their diet? This is not a mistake. I didn't just forget to put something in the slide there. Now, not one patient on the zero fibre diet had any symptoms. That's quite astonishing, really. And these findings were highly statistically significant, highly. They weren't due to random chance. Now, just out of interest, every single person in the low zero fibre group ended up having one bowel action per day, every day. How did this compare to those in the high fibre group? One bowel action on average every 6.83 days. Still think that fibre is good for constipation? <laughs> so for a good randomised trial, that, don't get me wrong, I, I believe there were 60 patients to do this. I mean, obviously to have even better, you, you'd be in the thousands or whatnot. But that's a real great showing. Any comments you, you guys want to make out of that? And obviously, I can be a te an, a, an a testament to this too. As a carnivore, I tell you, my bowel mo movement has been the best ever. Well, Raven, didn't you have a, a special relationship with fiber because of diverticulitis? That's right. So I I, I would spend uh, half an hour to an hour in the bathroom uh, at least three times a day because, well, I didn't realize at the time that would be called constipation, that it would take me that long to push mine out. And let me tell you, the, those, those bowel movements, it was, I struggled every time to get them out. Now, I can't even remember. I mean, I think I had one today, but I mean, it's so quick that I just, I don't even know if I do or not. Uh, I, it, it, it's a non-event. Before it was a religious event. You know, I had to sit on the throne, get my get my magazine or my or my phone. I mean, it was it was a whole ritual practically. So I wanted to show you guys a graph also. Uh, so high fiber, reduced fiber, and zero fiber. And you know, the best way to do it, guys, you can try this. You can do this at home if you want. Go a week with no fiber and see what happens. Yeah, I think I think this is an important fact because we've all been brainwashed to think that fiber is so important. And then, you know, we know as carnivores, one of the most common questions people ask us when we say we don't eat anything but meat, they're like, but how do you poop? How do you poop with no fiber? Because everybody's afraid to not get enough fiber. I think most people at some point in their life experienced constipation or knew somebody who did. And so you have this deep seated fear that, you know, if you don't eat a bunch of plant fiber, cellulose or whatever, then you're not going to be able to go to the bathroom. And it's just not the case. I mean, does anybody here have any problems going to the bathroom when all, they only eat meat? Nope. Well, I, I just, oh, go ahead, Joe. No, I don't. I, I just want to also make a point that people always also seem seem to think that the bigger your poop, the healthier that you are as well. So, you know, just well, sort of throw it out there. I was healthy before because I had some long logs. But let me tell you, <laughs> I didn't feel it, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, just to let you guys know, Dr. Paul Mason's a real doctor, and he is actually a Joe Zumbo's doctor. So, big shout out. Yeah, um, about the bowel movements though. So I've been eating just twice a day now for almost a month now. And I go what seems like once every three or four days now, um, but I'm not constipated. I right. just don't have to go. I'm just, my body's just become so efficient 
at using what I have that there's no waste, essentially. Um, I don't cool. fart, no gas, no burping. I mean, I, I think I do like a fart a day or every other day, pretty yeah. much it's been like that. Um, and they're not stinky or nothing either, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you just feel like a clean, efficient, fuel burning human. And so a lot of people get confused because sometimes it's like, if you are carnivore for a while, and especially if you're throwing in fasting, a quick answer could be like, oh, I don't, which sounds terrible, but it's like, no, I only when I have to. Whereas, you know, before, I think I've talked about it here, like when I was more plant-based, I was shitting constantly, or at least it felt like I was, like just cow patty diarrhea, like, you know, every day, at least in the morning, if not also at night, and sometimes in the middle of the night, and just off the chain, like spending too much damn time in the bathroom, there's life to live, you know? Or being really nervous about going to a new friend's house or to a cute, cute chick's house, because you're like, man, I hope I don't have to take a shit while I'm over there, you know? <laughs> I've had that and I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> have to use the plunger or, or scrape the ball, Raymond. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Even a little bit of street left over on that. <laughs> like, oh, God, you know. He's got gloves in his pocket to break the log. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, you're trying, to, you're trying to find where to scrape or put the toilet is. <laughs> yeah, trying to clean it up. Yeah. Anyways. All right. So. Nutrients and beef. Uh, beef has everything you uh, need in it, I believe. And uh, I am on a beef only diet. I've been doing it since March. And I've had not only no deficiencies, but I feel like I'm fueled even better than before with mm -hmm. mixed versions of meat. So, but you can see over here, it's got, uh, it's got everything you need. Uh, vitamin C might be the only thing but with vitamin C, it has in a very small amount, but as carnivores, we don't need that much vitamin C. Now, if you're worried about vitamin C, what does have a lot of vitamin C is liver. You can also do liver or you can leave your steak pretty bloody and that will give you a, a good amount of vitamin C. This is another one, um, which, you know, carnitine helps with uh, uh, mental illness. So that helps there. Now, to go on, let's talk about uh, meat cultures. So here's what's interesting. Th these are the meat cultures I found. Um, and I, I know they're all over, uh, uh, you know, all over the world. But most of them that I found that I could find eat raw. Inuits, they are known as Eskimos, which actually literally means eaters of raw meat. That's in the language, their language, but that got bastardized because of uh, the, the, the explorers and it was an insult. Uh, but they are known as Inuits. Uh, the Maasai, they would literally drink blood and, uh, and uh, milk. So what they would do is they would cut the artery of the cow and drain them of a little bit of blood, keeping them alive. And actually, this, they even said that the cows liked that. They look forward to the bleeding. Um, it did something for the cows. We don't know what. And they would milk it. They would mix the milk with the blood. And then that would be their daily sustenance. Uh, once, once, once every quarter or so, or maybe it was once a month or whatever, they'll have a celebratory uh, time where they would slaughter a cow and, uh, and then the village would eat it all together. But they subsisted on strictly uh, cows, <laughs> which is interesting because that's what I did too. Um, there's the nenets, the reindeer herders. They follow their reindeers everywhere. So when the reindeers migrate, they follow them. They use the reindeers for clothing. They use the reindeer for meat. They, uh, I believe they have also uh, milk from the reindeer. Uh, they also eat raw, which is fascinating. Now, what's interesting with the Nenets is that recently I was uh, looking at uh, the Siberian Times. And it was talking about the Nenets started trading with the Russian, uh, with the Russian uh, uh, post and getting sugar and flour. And their children cannot handle the cold. They're starting to get frostbites because of the poor diet. So they can't handle their natural cold that they used to for thousands of years because of the change of the diet. Isn't that amazing? And they're still eating raw, but they're just eating raw with sugar and flour. 
Um, you know, it's uh, interesting, Ray, is uh, I'd never heard of the Ninets till you brought it up because I'm used to the some of the other reindeer cultures I, I've read about many times, like the Sami. Sami, yeah. Or the Laps or whatever. But yeah. I just like to point out that, you know, some people migrated north, you know, thousands of years ago as the Ice Age set in and ate animals and they never came down. They've always lived out there doing this generation after generation for thousands of years. And that they live is off just climate. reindeer. Yeah, that is harsh climate that they're living in. Very and they're harsh. thriving on that, which is amazing. They're having babies in and that this, kind of climate. This happens all through Scandinavia. Like it ha it's happened in Finland, Norway, Sweden, um, and out into Russia, out into Siberia, and of course places like Greenland and stuff like that. Now, they eat caribou. They don't necessarily follow reindeer around, but you know that that animal is all some people eat, with the with the exception of maybe some fish and stuff like that. Right, some fish. That's right. I'm glad you said that. I forgot about the fish. Yeah. And it does is we're not saying they eat fish because we think fish is essential. It, right. I suppose it could be, but we, we have no evidence of that, right? Right. Right. Well, uh, de definitely most of the time they're eating their reindeers and they're sustained from that. Now, uh, the Mongolian nomads, they're a little different. They eat their meats raw also, obviously with their camels, yaks or whatever. And that's what they, they, they feed off. Um, so, uh, horses, horses is very common for the Mongolian nomads. Uh, and another red meat, right? I mean, horse meat's as red as any, right? That's right, red meat. And uh, they are not, ruminants though right tom um i don't think i don't think uh, horses have a rumen they have a different digestive tract but they do eat grass primarily so so my next slide i would like to mention dr weston price here's what's interesting from his observation traveling the whole world his idea dr price was surprised that he could not find a true vegetarian much less a vegan culture he went out trying to find one what he found was Swiss, raw and pasteurized dairy with rye, Gaelic fishermen, seafood, oats, no dairy, Eskimo, 100% animal and seafood, Maori, seafood, fatty porks, plant, coconut fruits, Maasai, no plant foods, beef, raw milk, organ meats, Bantu, beans, squash, corn, millet, vegetable fruits, some milk, some meat. Hunter-gatherers in North and South America, a variety of game animals, legumes, tubers, grains, vegetables, fruits, dinkas of Sudan, grains, fish, a little red meat, vegetable, fruit. See, all of them included meat in their diet. Dr. Weston Price, a dentist with a passion for nutrition, has been called the Isaac Newton of nutrition, traveled the world to discover the secrets of healthy, happy people. He recorded his finding in the 30s book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. From the Inuit in Alaska to the Maori in New Zealand, Price revealed that the diets traditional to each cult culture, although dependent on geography, followed a strict set of dietary laws. The most revealing commonality is an unerring reverence for animal foods. No traditional culture subsisted on a vegan diet, and it, a fact that Dr. Price found particularly interesting. Now, what else what he found was interesting, since he was a dentist, he went by health by the teeth caries, the dental caries and the teeth. What he noticed is the ones who actually ate the most animal-based had no dental caries. And I repeat, no dental caries. Meanwhile, those that subsisted on more of an omnivorous diet, they did have some, not very many, but some, not like today where we all have, you know, some kind of carry. Yeah, can I point out real quick that I think I think in the particularly in the vegan communities, it's, it's popular to point to the Hamza people that are near vegetarians. Right. They eat a lot of these nuts from this tree, right? Yes. No, if, but apparently, if the anthropologists who've lived with these people said if they ask them what their favorite foods are, it's first it's honey and second meat. The problem is they don't get much meat. Right. They used to be elephant hunters. And the elephants in their area got wiped out and they got moved to the land where there aren't very many elephants. So they depend on the nuts from these trees to eat, but it's not, it's not by choice. Yeah. By the way, dental caries, yes, cavities. So I, I just want to be clear uh, that that's what he called in his book, 
dental caries. But, uh, so I thought that's the scientific term, whatever, cavities. And, and, and I was like, throw it out though. I asked, I read this and then I asked my dentist about it. It's actually streptococcus, which is the number one bacteria that causes dental caries or cavities. And of course it likes, it likes sugar. It likes starches. So if you don't want to get uh, a sore throat, maybe, uh, and you don't want to have cavities, perhaps you should eat uh, less sugar and, and uh, less starchy stuff. Yeah. So what science is there on anybody who eats all meat? This is Wilhelm Hurst Stevenson. He has a book out called The Fat of the Land. He has many books, uh, Living with the Eskimos and all that. The Fat of the Land really talks about the, the food he ended up eating with them. And here's an excerpt that I have of his talk, of his time over there. Good evening, Dr. Stephenson. Um, will you tell me the correct way to pronounce your name? Wilhelm. That's the son of Wilhelm. 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 Well, this is as close as I'm going to come. I'm going to William. Um, well, now this raises the whole question of, uh, of food then. Um, surely, surely there's, there's some, uh, you yourself must have longed for a green vegetable once in a while. Well, I did it first. And I am, um, my first experience was that a ship that was supposed to meet me didn't meet me. Mm -hmm. And I had to become a guest of the Eskimos. And for four and a half months, I lived on literally nothing but fish and water. Well, we had some uh, blubber, some uh, polar bear blubber, but apart mm -hmm. from that. And at the end of four and a half months, I was still here and I'd never been before. I'm right. enjoying every meal and uh, feeling fine. And this is on an exclusive meat diet. That was exclusive fish in this case. Good. I have since then spent more than six, aggregated more than six years on red meat. That is uh, seal meat, caribou meat, muskox meat, or a bear, grizzly bear, and so on. You have to have fat with a lean. Uh, lean and fat together uh, make a perfect diet. A balanced diet. A balanced diet. Balanced diet. You have everything you need if you have both lean and fat. You don't have to eat any organs. That's a, a, a peculiar folklore. Oh, is that We so? eat the organs mostly to the dogs. Oh, this is where your earlier comment about uh, uh, being able to feed the dogs and the man and so on. Yes, for... we usually feed. They are the organs rich in vitamins that you hear so much talk about. Yeah. The dogs get most of them. I see. People don't care for them and don't eat. Well, now, one of Except the, in emergencies. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, you did was to demonstrate this fact, I take it, for the first time. Is that so? Well, not for the first time. I'm the Eskimos. <laughs> in fact, Stone Age man, I think that before the invention of agriculture, which dates back only about 15,000 years, before that, the whole world lived the way Eskimos did. Right. Approximately. Take the French cave art. Uh, the way the uh, artists show the French uh, cavemen living 40,000 years ago, that's the way we live. Yeah. Big game. So, Willem Hurst Stevenson was one of the first modern men that went on an all meat diet by, uh, by not by choice and showed the adaptation how, look, he wanted vegetables at first, but he adapted to it. Not only that, felt healthier than ever before. So now, obviously, that diet was founded way before that also, you know, with the band thing, but that was kind of low carb. And then there was a, another doctor that prescribed uh, just a uh, only meat diet back in the 1799 or whatnot. I don't know, so, somewhere in there. So there were people that's done it before, but Willem Hurst Stevenson, the beauty about him, he has it in the medical literature. This was a trial with uh, two men that lasted one whole year of meat only. And this is the conclusion. The evidence and opinions of the group of physicians observing us were summarized by Dr. Lieb in the American Journal of Digestion and Nutrition as a year's exclusive meat diet and seven years later here lee points out that my periods of exclusive meat diet total about nine years and that during these my sense of physical and mental well-being was at its best lee adds 
He found that the exclusive meat diet worked as well when he was inactive as when active and as well in hot weather as in cold. So that one year they did lab works, everything. At the end of the year, they actually ended up summarizing pretty much saying that, well, all your lab works look good, you're fine. And that was it. And they ended that way. Obviously they didn't put any fanfares behind it, you know, and uh, it was lost in memory from there. You guys want to comment on that? I did want to comment and say that, you know, he's famous for the book, um, not by bread alone or fat of the land, I think was the second edition. Mm -hmm. And it's not, has not been available in audio book. There are still prints out there. Most people read old PDF scans, but uh, we're collaborating with uh, Black Carnivore or a day Fox and a few other people. I think, uh, Dr. Lisa Wiederman and Dr. Sean Baker and uh, Michael Anthony, Raymond, Justin, Emily, and a bunch of other people have all volunteered <laughs> to read that book. And we should have um, all the chapters read before too long. And so if people want to enjoy the book in audio form via YouTube, we should be having that pretty soon. So everybody come through. Yeah, look forward to it. We will be having that soon. So that's going to be exciting. So this will be the book by Wilhelm or Stephenson that kicked us all off. Yes, he is the godfather as far as we're concerned. So now uh, I'd like to point out uh, some MDs that are carnivore. Dr. Sean Baker, uh, Dr. Paul Salandino, full uh, carnivore. Uh, this is uh, Ted Naiman. He is actually very meat heavy keto. And this is Dr. Jamie Seaman. She's also known as the fit and fabulous. She is also heavy meat keto. And I'd like to show some uh, uh, vegan doctors and we can see the difference. I mean, between the vegan doctors, I don't even know their names. Uh, help me out, Tom. Do you know who this guy is? I don't know the guy, the, the guy at the top, uh, the top uh, left guy there. I don't know. The one next to him is, um, I do know his name is. Uh, it's not Joel Kahn? No. Joel, Joel, I don't see Joel Kahn up there, actually. That's Joel Kahn's foot in the x ray. Oh, that's his foot. Okay. That, yeah. That, that's, Dr. that's Michael Gregor. Michael Gregor. Oh, that's his name. The guy with the broccoli on his shirt. That's yeah. Michael. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, I mean, if they were trying to convince me which diet worked better, uh, my own personal taste is I'd go with, you know, the more muscular doctors. But anyways, yeah. all depends on how you look at it. So list of doctors. So just to say that this is not out there at all. We have doctors and they have books. Carnivore diet it helps you uh, get to the where, where you need to be. Carnivore Code's a great read if you want to debunk a lot of the science that we've been fed to. Lies my doctor told me by uh, Dr. Ken Berry. He is also a heavy... He, actually, he's carnivore now, right? Yeah, he is carnivore. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Ted, Ted Naiman, uh, uh, the uh, performance and energy uh, uh, ratio diet. And that's a good one. So Lies my doctor told me really kind of goes into uh, kind of a layman's version. Uh, that helps people figure out what lies are out there, and that's really not scientific. That we think is science. And sorry, can I just can I just throw in also Dr. Paul yeah. Mason, who's who's also a carnivore. Yes, a doctor. Oh, well. that's right. Dr. Paul Mason is carnivore. He's, he's carnivore. Yeah. Do you have a book, Joe? No, not that I, no, not that I'm aware of. Lots okay. of good YouTube videos of Dr. Yeah, Paul lots Mason. Of, oh, lots of them. Yeah, low carb down under. He's got his own yeah. uh, channel, Dr. Paul Mason. He's active on Twitter, so yeah, he's, he's accessible on social media. And you guys saw his uh, no fiber presentation, so that, that's okay. So now, what happens if you go twenty years carnivore? I would like to show you this wonderful little clip. I really enjoyed. It's from one question. Vegan. That's it. It's interesting because I'm picking a vegan video to show you guys this, but I really like how he put. He likes stock the Andersons and had all their pictures. So I love the way you put it together. 
since a long time on my 50 views production list is what about Charlene Anderson? God damn it, I had to scroll 15 pages just to get to this comment again. Look at me, I'm so relevant and famous now. I feel like Fusey Duper Logan Paul. <laughs> Everybody tonight, I'm about to give a speech for the people that were delivered to me from God. Okay, the most important thing you will ask yourself is Charlene who? Apparently, Charlene is a lady which follows a ribeye steak and a diet now for nearly 20 years. She's mainly present on her blog and the Twitter page of her husband. And yes, she looks healthier and happier now than ever before. And I think it would be lying if I would tell you that I wouldn't find her attractive. Due to her age and her family behavior, she could definitely be classified as a MILF, which stands for mother in the late 40s, of course. <laughs> Today I want to explain to you how cases like Charlene Anderson can exist, even though they go completely against conventional wisdom, and what this means for the vegan movement. You often hear from people that the vegan diet just didn't work for them, and they quote, different things work for different people. But just how different are we? If you look at the data, there's about a 0.1% difference in our DNA. We all are members of the same species, Homo sapiens, and the definition of a species is the possible production of a fertile offspring. Human genetic diversity is substantially lower than that of many other species. So naturally, we just aren't as diverse as we think. And when it comes to nutrition, there's more likely a one-size-fits-all solution than a one-size-fits-one solution. Okay, I'll let this sink in for a while. A good example for this phenomenon is the Barnum effect. We think our problems, wishes, desires, and situations are special, yet the hard truth is they're not. The case of Charlene Anderson is therefore so interesting because malnutrition for a species usually concludes to an adverse change in our phenotype, which means a lessening of our attractiveness. And yes, both processed meat and red meat are known carcinogens. Yet Charlene, hands down, improved her attractiveness and her well-being dramatically. This puts people that are looking to help, like you and me, on thin ice. On one hand, we know that the diet of Charlene is hurting sentient beings and probably herself in the long term. But obviously, Charlene and her husband feel and look better on this diet. In my opinion, therefore, it's not ethically sustainable to suggest a change in diet to a person which she tried and probably would suffer from. Especially if you're not a doctor and make funny videos on the internet, <laughs> subscribe. But in my perspective, if all the evidence is true and Charlene indeed is not a scam, she's definitely an outlier from the data. The whole case here is an anecdote and not a study nor a first principle reasoning. And this whole story here reminds me of my dentist. He conducted a study on iron levels in the blood and remarked often that he feels great even though his iron levels are dangerously high. All the data out there indicates that high iron levels are extremely toxic for our organism. Unfortunately, despite all the data, he didn't change his lifestyle nor did he listen to the doctors. In his 60s, he died a sudden death, leaving behind a shocked family. To restate the point from my latest video, Charlene Anderson is an anecdote. She's an outlier and not a general practice. If you consider the data, the point of Charlene would look like this and not like this. There are chances that Charlene simply has an autoimmune disease that should be treated with a micronutrient and fiber deficient diet. But there are also chances that the later picture was just taken directly after a pregnancy. Nonetheless, a deficient diet like the carnivore one should never be general practice. So if you're watching this video, stick to the data when it comes to your health and don't follow an anecdote. If you like this video and want to know more about actually an excellent video with the pictures totally convincing me to go carnivore when i watch this but it's interesting how he says that we are all alike and i agree with him on that we are we're all human beings and uh all of us can thrive on a carnivore diet no question you guys want i to hate to say it ray but your your volume dropped again so all right, i uh, i don't know right back I don't know if the other guys noticed that as well, but uh, yeah, um, it totally right dropped back. off. Um, but yeah, I mean, the story of Charlene Anderson, you know, we know, so, so, you know, of course him being a vegan channel, I've never watched his channel, so I don't really know. Um, but with him, with the caveats, you know, he, he she's just an outlier, um, you know, got to listen to doctors. Um, I think earlier in this presentation, we've kind of debunked that already. 
but I mean, well, if she is an outlier, Ray's an outlier, I'm an outlier, Joe's an outlier, Tom's an outlier, et cetera, eventually you have enough outliers together where it's like, what when do we finally become statistically significant you know and i want to i want to take something that that guy said and flip it on its head because he's talking about this you know charlene's uh diet being a carnivore diet being deficient and it should never be standard of practice etc and obviously this is a plant-based guy so he's going to say that a balanced diet is, you know, based on this some variety of plants. I've never seen one that was based on just one plant. Right. So I always say, well, where were all these plants when we evolved? You know, for 3.7 million years, we know we've been butchering large mammals and eating them. And, uh, but we don't have any evidence of all these plants that these people supposedly eat now. I mean, you can get plants grown all over the world now. Crops have been you know, plants, we spent the last, you know, say three, 4,000 years detoxifying plants so we could tolerate them, you know? Mm -hmm. Every every type of wild potato is poisonous and it's a new world food. So, you know, people outside of the Americas didn't have potatoes. And you can say the same thing about corn and stuff like that. So um, I, I think that, you know, you gotta you gotta take that language when he says uh, this in, insufficient diet, you know, malnutrition uh, comes from just eating meat, and realize that nutrition always came from meat. And this whole this whole smoke and mirrors about eating plants goes back to a girl getting hit in the face of the rock and deciding she's a, a, a prophet of God, and that we all need to eat this Garden of Eden diet. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Can you guys hear me now? little better still not a hundred percent i don't know what's going on but i think it'll be fine for the yeah. a couple more slides yeah uh, let, let me show let me show a couple more slides and uh so i want to show kelly hogan 10 year carn 10 year zero car zero car carnivore uh my, michaela peterson she has a wonderful story i definitely advise you to look her up Great story. A lot of people went carnivore because of her and her dad. This is uh, Chris. Uh, he is actually out of Marietta. I've never met him, but he's very close to me. He lost uh, 220 pounds on his carnivore diet with uh, in less than like a year, which is incredible. Uh, this is uh, uh, Laura, Laura Spath. I mean, you could tell with her stomach. I mean, to have a flat stomach like that, and this is less than a year. Now, you could say, oh, well, none of these people are vegan. Well, if you look at a plant-based person that goes from plant-based to, to carnivore, and if you look close enough, you'll see the skin difference. It's just, a, it's just really amazing. Um, this and is, the inflammation, just in the face, the like the inflammation's off the chain. Yeah. The, the eyes, all that, you're absolutely right. And the clear skin, the whole thing. Now, Carnivore Yogi, she does her own videos, which is awesome. I definitely advise you guys to check her out. I never realized that she was that big. Um, and, you know, she's just fit and trim. And also with Dr. Fit and Fabulous, uh, Jamie Seaman, she's that doctor that I was telling you about. I mean, just amazing transformation. And if you say, oh, she works out, well, I bet she worked out before too. <laughs> just to keep that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> just to keep what she's got and then there's me and that's it so this is the list you guys will get a uh, uh show notes of all of this later oh, on oh you got a bunch of it all right yeah i've been i've been taking notes all along i got everything but that last uh, vegan guys video so far so um, um you, you don't need any all of it's indexed on the end of that slide so you have excellent. that slide so go ahead and just copy and paste it pretty much great yeah yeah you did an excellent job on this ray and uh i was really happy that we got a chance to record it and that uh, we could share it with people because it's a it's a very good resource so i hope good so job buddy i enjoyed it yeah thank you thank you you're a very compelling speaker all right, anything else from you meatheads?
Um, you know, just as you've seen, the data speaks for itself. Obviously, there's still more data. We have a Harvard study. Well, not we, but Dr. Sean Baker uh, has a Harvard study that's approved. Um, we've all done it. We did a different video on that, actually, as well. So, you know, but there's more research on this coming around, coming around. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's many success stories now, many different little websites being set up to promote or you know, to show the science of the carnivore diet. We're not here to say that we know everything and that it's a shut case and we know how to become, you know, optimally human, but we just keep hearing the same story over and over again. You were sick, you didn't feel as good, had a myriad of health problems, tried medications, tried therapy, tried so many different things, didn't work or had some improvement, but not as much improvement as they would have liked. They go carnivore, keto, you know, heavy meat-based keto, and within a year, a total turnaround. And now there's probably 40, 50, 60,000 stories, individual stories of the same thing happening over and over again. And it becomes like we could literally do shows from now till we all die of nothing but just success stories and not run out of content. It's just that pervasive, you know? And, you know, that's just, I know, but how many anecdotes add up to becoming statistically significant? So I hope anyone watching this, if you're not there yet, try it for 30 days, give it 60 days, you know? There's many different platforms that offer coaching, you know, many different free advice on Facebook, Instagram, minds.com, like, it's kind of everywhere. Yeah, you got to dig a little bit, but you know, we're a good community. I think we're friendly. You know, I've been in the vegan community and if you go off the rails on vegan, you get chastised, you know, I I've been there and you go a little bit off the rails. You know, I see posts all the time. Oh man, I ate a piece of bread or oh, I had a piece of broccoli and they're just like, Hey, you know, how do you feel? You know, and it's like, do you feel good? Did you feel bad? If you felt bad, you know what the remedy is. Get back to that beef, salt, and water. And don't fall down that damn carb hole. Don't fall down the <laughs> carb hole. Meat is a species appropriate of uh, a diet, in my opinion. And uh, I'm right there. I think uh, we all thought uh, just eating meat and nothing else sounded crazy when we first heard about it, right? We were all suspicious. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. I knew about it for a year and a half before I tried it. I stumbled onto it. I found myself gravitating towards it and thinking I felt like I was doing something wrong. And then I I started looking into it and realized there was thousands of people already doing it. I was like, "What? There's all these people out there eating nothing but meat? Holy cow! It's real." And then you start meeting people who've already been doing it for 10 years or whatever. You know, we had Mark Wimmer on. I just, just talking to Dr. Lisa. She's like 11 years. And Amber O'Hearn, uh, talk to her from time to time. Hopefully we'll get Amber on here one of these days. You guys help me think of a topic that would entice Amber to come on with us because I'd love to chat with her. So anyways, there's lots of people been out there uh, eating this way for a long time. It's not new. Um, it's just become people are becoming aware of it. You know, there's been populations around the planet continually eating just meat for thousands, if not millions of years, who eat very little or no plants, could care less if they eat plants. Um, and that's just how it is, right? It's we're rewriting, we're, we're correcting history, right? We're co correcting the wishful thinkings of a, the prophet of God who thought we should all eat this, uh, garden of vegan <laughs> diet right all right guys well i'm going to do the usual and tell everybody please subscribe leave us some uh comments and hit that uh, like button hit the you know like you've button. been here you've like, maybe subscribe. watched three four five videos you're gonna watch another video because you can't get enough of us you want to see ray's six pack again so you might as well subscribe make sure you hit that bell because you know youtube's pretty finicky you know so hit the goal hit the bell Make sure you get select all so you get notifications every time we drop a video. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Way to sell it. All right. 
Well, send this, uh, send a link on to people too who can benefit from this, you know, at least uh, inspire a little conversation, you know, maybe send it to your, even to your favorite vegan. <laughs> all right. So that's it. Thanks again. I appreciate everybody who, who watched and I appreciate all the hard work that Ray put into his presentation. So everybody eat some meat and feel better. <laughs>